okay, we're recording. Sue, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Guy. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to connect with you again. I've been I've been thoroughly enjoying um, revisiting a lot of your work over the last few weeks too, and there are so many aspects and topics that could be covered today. It's it's not funny in the, in the short space of time that we have together. Um, but I always like to start the, the show, and my first question to you is, because with everything you teach, if somebody asks you what is the essence of your work or what you teach, how do you reply these days? Mm. Well, many things that we can say, as, as, you, as you have mentioned, that there are many angles to speak about, but the foundation of the work is that we are trying to awaken as a species. We're trying to wake up to more of our full potential and the truth of who we are, which means awakening from the illusion that this outer world is in charge and that it is the impetus from, you know, to which we are supposed to respond. When in reality, what quantum science is showing us is that we are the creator of this experience that we're having. And so until we learn how to masterfully become that creator, uh, we struggle and we we are uh, disempowered and we are disillusioned so often. So my work is about teaching people how to gather their resources again to be able to recognize themselves as that creator and walk out into the world um, being able to self-heal and self-regulate and generate creative projects and see them through to fruition and allow um, ourselves to truly leave this place better than we found it, rather than coming here just trying to survive it. And so I work with people to get them to feel the energy because uh, it is, while it is visible, uh, most people to the naked eye, it is not visible. You know, when I was a kid, I could see energy and I, I lost it. I shut it down, wow. actually. And then I returned to being able to see it again. And so I know what it's like to be on both sides of that. And, um, and so the tools that I, that I create for people are tools to feel and sense themselves working with the raw energy underneath the story of their lives, the circumstances of their lives. And I'm able to see and witness uh, the effectiveness of that in, in working with people. But the, but the bottom line is I'm teaching people how to work with the raw energy of our uh, our bodies and the soulful self and the essence of who we are in a, in a masterful way so that we can sense and feel uh, what is true for us and how to, to lead life from this empowered perspective of a multidimensional energy being that we truly are. So it's a long explanation, but yeah, it's a short. No, it's a beautiful one. And you've triggered so many questions already. And, uh -huh. and I think about, um, I think about the last two years that especially here, you know, obviously in the world, but for me here in Australia and um, for me, it kind of, it's been highlighting how disconnected we are from many of the things you just shared, because there's a lot of fear going through the country and uh, through the globe. And we don't know how to, I guess, work with this pressure that's been put upon us and the, do you, do you believe that's part of our evolution and growth? Because you mentioned at the beginning that as humanity is awakening, do you think that's what's happening at the moment? I do. And I feel that the pressure that we are experiencing is a pressure that is apparently required um, until we awaken to creating that compression ourselves. Think of it this way. When we land here, we sort of land and we splat and we disperse our energies. Our mind goes one way, our body another, our breath another, and we're disconnected. We're not utilizing all of our resources collectively as a unified force. If so, we would use the body to tell the mind to listen to the gut feelings and the inspirations and the intuitions and the inner knowings above and beyond anything that we see in the outer world. We would trust it beyond beliefs. We would trust it beyond logic. We would just trust it. And 
uh, and we don't do that. We've become involved in the outer world. We've directed our attention from that splat. We kind of started looking around to see, am I safe? Should I do this? Should I not? How do I engage? What should I do? If you tell me what to do, then I'll do it. If you approve of me, then I'm okay. If you love me, then I'm loved. And none of that is true, but it might as well be true because that's how we live. And so at some point, we don't get to keep doing that because the soulful evolution um, would not have it. We came here to awaken to the truth of who we are and then to bring that truth out into the world and, and create a world that is a reflection of our deepest, most true selves, which is based in peace and harmony and love and devotion and, and creativity and win-win and, and connectivity. And so because that's not happening and people are still so reactive to the splatted state and still waiting for someone to tell them what to do and, and waiting for someone to love mm. them so that they are lovable and waiting and you know that, then the, the universal uh, system is going to have to put pressure on us in order for us to gather back and collect ourselves again. Now we could do it consciously and intentionally. We could just take a hold of it and pull it together. We could get ourselves together, but no one has taught us how to do that. So nobody even knows that's what we're supposed to be doing. So here we are out here in this splat. The cosmos is putting pressure on, like creating a reality where no one knows what's true. No one knows if they're being told the truth. No one knows if this is real or that's real because there's so much conflicting information and in both sides of every story from from politics to healthcare to our future with with the with the planet itself all of it has you know been been seeping into this world of duality ultimately i feel giving us an opportunity to pull ourselves back from this world of duality and back into a unified state of consciousness a unified state of being meaning that at the end of the day, we have to learn to trust ourselves. We have to make decisions that are right for us. We have to make decisions based on what we feel to be true and to feel to be good and feel to be right and aligned and in and integrity in an integrated fashion. Um, and that's also by you know, no coincidence, what the soul's purpose is. The soul's purpose is to come here and unify mind, body, breath, and evolve itself through this obstacle course that we call planet earth. So we go through all these relationships and circumstances and dynamics and situations all to shake us up, wake us up so that we can start making conclusions and decisions and getting a feel for, Hey, here's, here's who I am. You know, this is what's real for me. And if it's actually true, it will be a loving individual. It will be a compassionate individual that has enough mm. energy, enough space, enough time to collaborate and to connect and to be kind and, and to be generous. And so, um, you know, because that hasn't been happening on our own volition, the universal forces are kind of making it happen. We're being forced to go home and figure it out and be with ourselves and deal with ourselves, <laughs> and deal with all of our frustrations and our fears and our angst. Just deal with it because it's not changing, uh, you know, anytime immediate. And so that impatient mind that's so used to immediate gratification, which is really a very immature version of who we are, is now having to sit down, sit, stay, you know, heal. And, uh, and hopefully that is how humanity will begin to perceive these circumstances that we're in and allow it to be of service to us instead of something that just is maddening and you know, taking us over the edge in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, why do you think we, uh, I'm trying to see how to frame this, because I think on my own journey that I, I was oblivious to any of this work existing until I had my own awakening to. Like, it, it just wasn't on my radar. I was completely unconscious about the whole thing. And it never occurred to me that that I had no awareness to this. So my actions and everything were doing, I was actually keeping myself locked in that paradigm unknowingly. And when I started leaning into this work, though, leaning into this work terrified me, I think, more than the reality that I knew. But that was all, of course, being in my mind, not in my heart. Why do you think we wait so long until we then finally decide to 
step into this work or why do we fear it so much because it's it's life-changing and it's amazing and i'm so yeah. grateful that i'm in my 40s i've I'm, I'm kind of living from this place and actually you're a little ahead of the curve you know right it actually begins <laughs> right at that time for most people if if at all right. uh, and sometimes in people's 50s and 60s and 70s that you know so why we're afraid of it is simply because it's unfamiliar because the false self when we splat when we land here and we splat we develop this personality out here on the perimeter of that splat, way out here on the edge. And it's it's a functioning um, set of circuits. It's a functioning program, but it's not the truth of who we are. It's just the way that we get by. And we navigate mm-hmm. and we, we work with life in a certain way and we create relationships and we choose professions and we build families and we do the things that we do way out there from that place. Even though we can love from that place, we can make conscientious decisions from that place. It's not the truth of who we are. And so when we come upon the pain that also gets associated with living out there because we're not operating from the whole self, it is inherently going to have some components to it that are feeling lack and feeling, I wonder what's real. I want this isn't something's missing or something's wrong, or it has this undercurrent sensation about it because it's not anchored in the true self. It's out here anchored in this surviving self, this performing self that we had to create in order to get by. And so when all of a sudden there's this other version of ourselves starting to peer through, starting to emerge because it's going to in the course of our lives, it will emerge. It it, may be in the last five minutes of our lives when we're too tired and too fatigued to keep suppressing it in all of the ways that we did unknowingly, but it will emerge. And so when it does start to emerge, it's a little unnerving because it's like, it's unfamiliar. It's just unfamiliar. And so this this protective personality who controls things and controls life so that it can feel safe is now unable to control this because it's, it's a cosmic force. It's not just a, you know, a man-made idea. It's much bigger than our mind, our thinking mind or our perception of self. When the true self starts to rise, oh my goodness, the whole, the whole uh, false self you know, feels a quaking underneath and, and it gets very nervous that its identity is going to be threatened, that its very livelihood will be threatened. And who am I? If I'm not this, I don't know. But the surrender that has to happen is actually just a surrender into my true self. If I just would just come inside and just fall in, that's really the only thing we're Mm -hmm. ever surrendering to. But the mind conjures up that I'm surrendering to something out there. It's probably bad and, and frightening and not good for me. It actually is so much better for us that, you know, the mind is, is, uh, is wrestling uh, with it because it is so incredibly foreign to it. You know, why it takes us so long is because I feel we are running on the default mechanism. And the default takes a lot longer uh, to, to generate this awakening than when we are, you know, brought forward with intention or through intention or or through a teaching or practice that is upon us. And so our parents weren't raised with it and their parents weren't raised with this awareness and so on. But each generation is awakening more and awakening sooner and awakening as in a greater proportion of the population, a greater percentage of people are currently in this conversation than in the history of humanity. So the beauty is we're we're gaining on it, you know, so that we're able to in our 30s and 40s and 50s raise our children with the exposure to these ideas in a way that they won't be so intimidated when it begins to happen with them. In fact, they'll actually be reaching inside and drawing it up and out little by little um, because they're not afraid of it, because they're being exposed to the ideas about what we're talking about right now. So if we don't do this consciously and intentionally, you know, that's the proverbial, you know, cosmic two by four that slams us into some awakening (laughs) or we get sick or we get a diagnosis and we're like, no, it's not for me. I'm going to beat this. Or, or we, we go through a series of, you know, stressful circumstances in life simultaneously and they collectively are enough to rattle the cage or thin the veil or poke a hole in the veil and, and open it comes and, and the truth starts to emerge. So it's inevitable, 
you know, the question is, will it be a graceful ride? Will it be a rough ride? And, you know, we are at choice to allow it to become graceful. Many people who aren't watching this conversation, it will be a little rougher when people share this conversation with friends that might not be uh, mm. pursuing it actively, they might start to thin their own veil just because of, of listening to such a conversation. Even if they've had nothing close to a conversation of this nature running through their own mind, as soon as they're exposed to it, it begins a process. It begins to, oh, I didn't have any idea there were there were two versions of me, you know, at least two versions of me. And that the other, the other less known is actually in support of the one that I know. And the one that I know less, uh, less well is actually going to serve and enhance and enliven and anchor and ground and nurture the one that I've been operating as, you know, when that idea comes into the mix, instead of either or, it's like, oh, it's just going to enhance me. Okay. Then I'm interested rather than is it going to yeah. throw me away and, you know, rise as some alternate version of me that I don't even know. That sounds very uninteresting. You know, people are not interested in that, but, but it's a both and conversation. It's not an either or, um, you know, in the big picture. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. That's why I'm so passionate about podcasting because in my own evolution and journey, I didn't have anyone to talk to about this and podcasting is what got me intrigued and interested and it was like being able to hang out and have listening on a coffee table conversation if you like going wow there are other people talking about this and and uh it's been just something i've been committed to ever since you know i'm putting it back out there yes. um I, i'm curious to know because you talk of the soulful self and the splat and we come here and and I see this come up a lot in questions and things. And I'd love to have your perspective on it. Is why aren't we coming here as the true self, knowing that our totality of who we are? Why is that not revealed? And we have to seem to go on this laboring journey to come back to reconnect to that aspect of ourselves that's ever present anyway. We just haven't been able to see it or yes. be with it. <laughs> yes, a great question, right? It's like, why would we do that? <laughs> Why would we set it up this way? Yeah. It was painful. So we have to realize that the universe is expanding, that everything in creation is expanding. The manifest world is expanding and it's always expanding. So human consciousness inside of that is also expanding. And so we are on the edge, the cutting edge of that expansion. We're on the frontier of that. And so in order to be on the frontier of that, what happens is we land here and in that splat, we are piercing ourselves into the unknown. We're piercing ourselves into the part of the manifest world that is not awake, that's not conscious. It's more dense than that. And so we are the light of awareness itself. We are pure consciousness. And so just picture it like, we are piercing ourselves into the darkness, into the density where consciousness does not exist, just barely survival exists. And then inside of that realm, we're going to wake up. And when we wake up inside of a realm that previously was so dense, it was not conscious. We bring the consciousness to that layer of the manifest world. So we are what's out here on the frontier of it moving into areas that where consciousness does not exist and awakening, turning the lights on inside of that and therefore bringing light to an area, a level of human experience that was not conscious. Think of it like spelunking, like we're, we are the flashlight and we're going into a cave and we're crawling in, the lights turned off and we're crawling into this cave and we get all the way in there and then we realize the limitations of living in the dark and we turn on the flashlight and the whole cave lights up. Now there's light in that cave for the first time. And it's because we went into our life experiences in the dark. We went into them blinded, basically. We're just doing the best we can. We build these relationships. We start engaging and exchanging. We develop these careers and we start engaging and exchanging. We don't know really what we're doing. We're just doing the best that we can. And when we start to meet up with the limitations of operating in the dark, 
we start becoming curious. There's got to be a better way. I'm so frustrated. I've tried this a million times. Here I am again in this type of scenario with this relationship. Here I am again with my with my work or my career. Here I am again with family and this kind of thing. And when we're when we hit that level of frustration, we start saying there's got to be more. There has to be something else. And in that moment, we're starting to reach for the flashlight. We're like, wait a second, let me take another look at this thing that I'm carrying. And as I start to turn the lights on, I'm what I what's happening in my life that is synonymous with that is I'm I'm having a crisis that causes awakening. I'm maybe just stressing a little bit and I'm being a little preemptive preemptive and I'm watching a podcast like this or I'm reading a book or taking a course or doing things that are starting to, oh, illuminate, illuminate the fact that I, have oh my gosh, I've just been operating in the dark. And so, so the, the reason that we don't land knowing, although there will be a time when we do. And if you look to our younger generations, mm. they are brighter, younger when they're born. More babies are being born with their eyes wide open and here and present and lucid than ever before. And I remember 20 or, I don't know, maybe 30, closer to 30 years ago now, uh, in my clinic, um, when the conversation of indigo children w- was up and, uh, and the crystal children that came after that. And this, these indigo children were, of which I, I realized that I was one, but it, it was someone who, who was actually born knowing but then got involved in the world and got convinced that we didn't know and shut it down only later to realize, oh my gosh, I was right. I knew this when I was a kid. So that was a generation, the indigo children that came in, you know, my, my generation at my, at my age, I'm 60 years old. And at, at that time it was, I was about 48. So it was, you know, about 12 years ago. So, um, uh, or, or actually, uh, it was actually a little longer than that, but what was happening was, was people my age and younger were in this population that were called the indigo children. Now, some, not everyone was, but but that's how old they were. And it was this generation of individuals who who knew. They just had knowings. There was a wisdom that was beyond their years, and it was it was what we were experiencing. To to bring that out was our version of turning on the flashlight, and um, and generations thereafter there are even greater and greater percentages of, of, the, of the species that are more awake than, than ever before. And so we're, with each generation, we're, we're landing with more knowing. More of us are landing with more knowing. And I think that's a very good thing. It's a very good sign. And, and I feel that the reason for that is when enough of us have been spelunking, Okay, enough of us have been going into the cave and turning (laughs) on the lights. We're kind of carving a pathway so that when they land, there's less of an abrupt splat. It's really just sort of a a cushiony landing and they don't splat and disperse so extensively. And so they can kind of pull themselves together more readily and they can be at this integrated state more easily. And I think that's been happening, you know, since the beginning of time. I think that the numbers are just improving and enhancing to the degree that it's it's palpable. We can see it happening now that um, that we are able to steward these young people in ways that that can put things together rapidly. You know, we have the joke about if you can't figure out your computer, you know, ask a five year old. If you can't figure out your technology, you know, ask a ask somebody other younger than ten, and they'll you know, oh, they just have the answer because they're in this already. And so, so I think it's sort of that, that, that what is occurring is an evolution. And we, we have previously landed and splatted in the density purposefully so that we could you know, bring the light further than it has been before, if that's helpful. It is helpful. And you almost answered my next question, or I was going to answer it because I feel myself going deeper and deeper with these questions with you. But it's it's wonderful that do we get to reoccur or redo this, this black landing? And 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 if we don't get to the bit where we get to turn the flashlight on, do we get to go again? Are, are we are we here to learn a certain aspect of ourselves? 
I, uh, I think in every sense of the word, we get to go again. So I think we come, I, I personally feel we keep coming back until we get this together and we have a soft landing, that we get it together and we, we can touch down without splatting. And I feel that we've been doing this for a long, long time. I don't think this is our first round. I think we've been coming at this. I have personal memory of multiple times of being here and, and wow. living fully, you know, at, at that type of thing. Now on maybe some more tangible level that maybe some additional people could relate to if having past life type of conversation isn't really in the realm of, of what they can check off as, you know, clear science or something reliable and tangible. Uh, what we do know is that quantum science is saying that we are timeless beings, that we are only as subject to time as we believe that we are. And we don't ever challenge it, so we might as well be affected by it. And so we, we have a hard time beginning again because we carry the grudge and we carry the history and we carry the story. But that story contains a limitation to the, this, this true essence that we are. We are this ray of light that comes to the earth and is not supposed to splat, but to rise, touches the earth and gets and gets transduced down for third dimensional reality for human consumption is how I call it. And this is measurable and scientific completely. It rises up through the body, comes out the top of the head and cycles around the outside of the body as this measurable biofield called the toric field. It comes in at the tip of the spine and rises up through the system and recycles and recycles and recycles. And it's constantly replenishing, constantly replacing to the degree that every cell in our body is replaced within a seven year period. And so we are new and renewed all the time. So if we would allow everything to be renewed in that same cycling fashion within seven years, no experience in our past should be having an effect on us any longer. So even by default, but we keep holding on to it and keep reproducing its effects every time that this toric field keeps flowing and cycling. If I keep my mental body in a certain configuration, holding on to my past with grudges or abandonments or issues of, you know, of unresolvedness in some way, then I keep reproducing the same pattern of flow through the body. I have a picture here that might help this. That this is how the energy flows down through the body. It hits the earth, rises up through the body, comes out and cycles around and keeps recycling. And it's constantly perfecting and replenishing and rejuvenating and replacing anything that's not in its perfected expression. But most of us are living like this. Most of us have this energy that's coming down, hitting the earth. It rises up and we interfere with it. We interfere because we have beliefs. I'm not good enough, or I got shut down, or I had this physical accident, or I live under these circumstances. And this wobbling rise, wobbling rise of this rising energy creates a distortion in the energy field. Now, this person is looking out through a distorted field and they see a distorted reality. They see one that keeps affirming that they're not enough and keeps confirming that that luck is not on their side and keeps reestablishing that they're not smart enough to do this or they're not respected enough to have that or whatever. And it just continues to be true. However, these things are based on past experience. They're not true. They're just how we reacted at some point in the past. And we kept reacting to it until it became a belief. We kept thinking that it was true consistently enough or it was potent enough that it got seared into the subconscious. And so the subconscious continues to hold us in these patterns. And so this is not going to be rejuvenated like this system is in that seven year period or in seven days for that matter. It won't get to reap the benefits of how the system is designed to be functioning. And so the beauty is in any moment, we could decide this isn't true anymore. This one conclusion that I drew about myself or this one isn't true anymore. Actually, it's not true. I can look around. I can realize I have evidence. And even beyond logic, I just don't want it to be true anymore for me. I just choose to have it not be true. So if someone says, well, if, if I really did get abused or I really did get abandoned, how can I just have that not be true? Well, you know, this is an interesting conversation because, um, how much do we need it to continue to be true is, is really a question for us as creators 
of our life experience? How long do we need to continue to be the victim of something that happened maybe 20 or 30 years ago? Maybe it's mm. actually not still happening anywhere except in my own consciousness. And if I were to let go of that, even if I could still keep all the benefits that I got from learning to be a compassionate, conscientious person, because I went through some hard times. I know what it's like to go through those hard times. Now I'm a better person and I'm, I'm able to care for others or be supportive to people in ways that I never would have been had I not been through such difficulties or other benefits that may have occurred in our lives, realizing who we are as a loving person, realizing who we are because of what we're not because of what we were exposed to. And we realized I'm not going to be like that. So now I'm going to be this instead. So we get to keep all those benefits, but we don't have to keep that story going the way that it was through our system because it hasn't been that way for maybe a long time. Now, maybe someone's living in an abusive circumstance right now, but today is different than yesterday. And if, if you choose today to release that way of living and to release that reality from your system, there are ways that you can learn to do that. Now, that's what I teach people how to do because I can't just say, okay, just do that. You know, people are like, how? Mm -hmm. So I teach them how to do that inside of my energy codes work and, and so forth. But what I want to impress upon everyone today is that it can change any moment that we can gather ourselves back from the splat, get the conscious and the subconscious on the same page and have the power to pierce through the veils. These are the little veils that create this reality that we don't like living in. So we can pierce right through that and create this from this. It's changeable. So to answer your question, bioenergetics, quantum science, uh, the biofield, the, the psychosomatic network of neurons and chemistries that we are constantly working with inside of our system, they have the ability to change in an instant. We just have to learn how to ground that instant and integrate that instant so that it is sustainable, so that it's not just some whim of an imaginary idea that, oh, yeah, I'm done with that. And then we find ourselves still reacting in the ways that we always have relative to that negative impact that occurred in our lives. But if we're willing to be the timeless being that we actually are, the answer to your question is, yes, we can change it. At any time in our lives, we can have an impact on changing the expression of this divine creative energy that we are. We are divine creative energy and the universe is abundant and we are made of the universe. So we are abundant in every facet of the word. We are abundant in our health, abundant in love. We are abundant in our ability to flourish in the world and in you know all ways of success, That however we might measure that. And if we're not experiencing that, it means we have one of these patterns that are just locked in and we're not allowing it to flush and flourish and replenish and replace the way that the universe is constantly trying to. We've just, you know, hunkered down in our way and think that's all that's possible. But it isn't true. It isn't true. It, it, wow. And science is certainly showing us that it isn't true. So there was so much in what you just shared then. Oh, my God. I know. And I, I, know. I, had, a, I had a big light bulb moment with the, the seven year cycles. Cause I, you know, I've, I've heard many times of, um, uh, you know, everything they say, everything happens in sevens, you know, when you're seven years old, 14, 21 and so forth and, and look at different cycles in my own life, but not actually brought down into that perspective before, yes. you know, and I, I think, so would it be fair to say then, because we're always trying to think our problems through where if we keep recreating a certain feeling and an emotion and, behavioral patterns and, and li living life a certain way yeah. that we, we re with what you're sharing there, that the, the field is holding information, the body's holding information, but it's almost like these are the last places we tend to go to create, to create, I guess, um, a homeostasis, a, a, well, a well-being within us where we condition just to focus on the symptom and the physicality of it all in Western life. So yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 I guess is where should we be looking to start to to create that um, way of being, connecting back to the true self? Yes, you know, we are we are plagued with a habit of externalization of our attention, 
externalization of our focus. We look out there for all of it, everything, for everything. And if, if there were one thing that humanity could do to improve its awakening process and to facilitate its evolution, it would take its attention off of the outer world, at least for a portion of each day, and return its attention inwardly. In the Eastern culture, it was referred to for thousands of years and still is as pradyahara, and it means withdraw the senses back onto the true self. Just come back home, come back in here. And we don't do that unless we're grieving or unless we're flabbergasted or unless we're just taken aback. What happens is then we come in, we land and we do some soul searching and it's just a little weekend project for us instead of it being a way of living. And it should be a way of living if we truly want this to be a change that is sustainable. We, we externalize our power because we externalize our attention. We look at the symptoms, we then chase the symptoms, then we treat the symptoms, or we excise the symptoms to get them out of our bodies or whatever. Or we, we look at our relationship that isn't, that isn't flourishing. And, it, and, and really we need to understand that that's a symptom. And so we, we just throw the relationship away and go get another one only for a few years into it, mm. find ourselves dealing with the same thing because we didn't ever get at the cause. We didn't ever turn our attention back to where everything is coming from. It's all coming from deep within and it's emanating and radiating itself out here into this life experience in a way that's either beautiful or painful. And that has to do with where we keep our attention. If we keep our attention on recognizing the things that are happening are just feedback the things that are happening in my life are just feedback and they are feedback telling me how I'm doing at keeping my eye on the ball, staying in my lane. My lane is really to keep my mind onto the self deep here in the core of this presence, this being that I am, and to honor what's happening in there, to, to steward it. The mind's job is to steward the soul, but the mind it was like, Oh, I can drive. Okay, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And it's having a great time, except that it runs out of passion. It runs out of juice. It runs out of purpose. It runs out of, of clarity because it's not supposed to be out there running around like that on its own. It's supposed to be back here serving the source of its own existence, serving the source of its own existence which is the self. Pratyahara, bringing our attention back onto the self, allows the mind to now be connected with what's really going on here, what it's really supposed to be doing. It begins to feel mm -hmm. a sense of purpose. It begins to feel a sense of fulfillment. It begins to flourish. It finds that life is so much easier than it used to be. It allows for this grace to take over. And a byproduct of that is... Um, integration, evolution, awakening. And uh, this is where we're, we're meant to be living. So hopefully that's helpful with what we're, yeah, we're speaking to. 100% it is. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm just curious in your own life, Sue, how do you navigate the world? Like, how do you come to decisions and whether they're big life decisions or smaller decisions? You know, because there's obviously an intuitive process. I mean, look what you've created, what you do, the impact you have on the world. I mean, it's incredible. And I'm just interested to know what, what's behind that a little bit. I'm, I'm so glad you asked because people would never believe it. It has been the easiest thing I've ever done. Um, and it's become a global conversation. <laughs> and not that I didn't work at it, but I only worked at it until I realized what we're sharing here today. So... So I'll say this, the way that I make decisions is in an instant. I make decisions really quickly and really easily because I'm not making decisions. I'm just asking. I'm just paying attention to what's rising in this system. Because if we go back to this, the universe, meaning universal energy, but universal intelligence, okay? The universal mind is, pour, is what's pouring through this system. It's the universal information and it rises right up through us. And if we have directed our attention onto our core, 
we're in touch. We're in touch with it. We're in touch with this universal information that is rising. It rises like a hunch. It rises like a gut feeling, like an intuition, mm. like an inner knowing. And I'm constantly paying attention to the inner knowing. I'm much more interested in the inner knowing than the statistics and or in the processes and the procedures that others do that work, that makes it happen. Because I also witness how much pain most of those people are in that are living from their head and, and driving their lives and creating businesses and creating circumstances. And so long ago, I became curious. I wonder how far love can go. I wonder how far inner wisdom can go. I just am curious. And my life kind of became an experiment about that. And so I began to, to just only make decisions that were in alignment with what I really felt to do. Even if somebody was saying, no, you have to do this. This is what everybody's doing. You got to do it this way. This is it. This is it. I would be like, I tried it a few times and it was so painful. It always crashed for me. It never worked for me. And so I'm like, I had two choices. Either I could say, what's wrong with me? Why don't these things work for me if they work for everybody else? Which is what most people do. But I didn't. For some grace-filled reason, I decided to interpret that as, I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> There's something else I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not supposed to keep trying to do that until I get it right and it works for me. I'm supposed to do this my way, whatever that is. I don't even know what it is. But I did know how it would feel if it was true for me. Because I could tell that some of those other choices weren't true for me. I wasn't aligned with them. I was just approaching it from an intellectual standpoint. Do this. This is what everybody's doing. And I would try it and it would just like, it would fall flat as a pancake. It would just never work for me. So I was like, well, I'm here. And I'm not going to stop lo living and loving and working to help and serve humanity. And then I had this big opening and this big awakening happen. And it was like lightning came right down through my system. And it was like, hmm, I'm going to follow that because that's pretty convincing. You know what? I have another picture here that kind of shows what happened Please. for me. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm down here in this toric field thing, minding my own business. And then one day in meditation, boom, I lit up. In, in, a, in an illuminated state, all because I was doing it my way, not because I was doing what I was supposed to do or what everybody else told me to do. I sat down in a meditation was like, man, I am just going to do this for me. I don't care if I'm meditating right. I don't care if I'm following the practices. I'm just going to do this for me. And boom, this thunderous bolt of lightning just came down into my system and uh, lit me up. And so from that moment on, my mind was trying to grapple with my old way of being, but it just kept coming home to this feeling, to this sensation. Now, I've taught lots of people who haven't had a bolt of lightning or thunder come through their system or illuminated how to do this. So don't think for a minute that that's necessary. But, but, I, but I teach people how to align and to open in such a way that they can feel that same truth rising. And so the decisions that I make are easy to make, but I want to say this, um, how I make those decisions so easily isn't determined in the moment that it's time to make a decision. It's made in between those moments. In my in-between moments, I'm constantly working to enhance my ability to sense and feel what's going on in here and who and what I truly am, to train my mind to find me down in here. Because the real me is what's rising in here. I used to think I was the mind that was looking for an answer. But now I realize I am the answer. And I just have to train my mind to find me. So that when my mind is trying to make a decision, it can. Because it knows how to find me. And I know. The depths of me know the answer. The depths of every one of us knows the answer for any question that their mind will ever come up with. Because... The depths of us is made of the universe. There's nothing missing. All of the knowledge is there. We are compressed into a funnel, into a channel. We descend to the earth and we rise. And that's how we get to the physical dimension. And that's what we're doing here. So in that, we become chemistries and neurosynapses and all sorts of things that we love to study. We love to study the science of all that. But that's, this, that's the effect. Just like 
we're talking about chasing symptoms. We're so obsessed with how the brain works and how the, the, ner- the, the, the neurosynapses and the molecular uh, configuration of an emotional field and how it rises to the brain and we become aware of it and how that all works and being wired together and fired together and all of that happens until it's a sustainable way of breaking habits. And we're obsessed with learning about that stuff. And I love to do it too, but it, that's all an effect of what we really are. We are truly invisible mm. energy that has compressed itself here into the physical dimension and we are on the move. And the sooner we can train our minds to know that to be true, the sooner we're not at the effects of what we've studied. You know, when we study anatomy and physiology, we're really looking at history. And what we are is the creators of this now present moment and the future. And so, so it's, you know, I could just go on and on about it, but, but I just want to say that I spend a lot of time breathing into the belly and up and down the central channel, these techniques that I teach people because I want a super highway carved between my gut feelings and my conscious awareness. Lastly, I'll say 11 billion bits of information bombarding us every millisecond from the cosmos. Okay. They don't come to our head. They come to our gut and we interpret them through little antennas on the surface of the cells and receptor sites that translate that into chemistry and neurosynapses that rise to our awareness. And if we don't get in the way, we get to receive all of the information that we need when we need it to have and handle and manage any circumstance that we have. So the way I make decisions in my life is to constantly be building a super highway so that I can have access to the information that I need. And it might not be, you know, mathematical equations that come out of me any given moment. It might just be a "Mm, thank you, no. I'm not, you know, thank you. No, it sounds great, but I'm glad that's working for you, but not for me. I'm going to do this instead because I just want to, I just feel it. I feel it. And if people would start to learn to live this way, uh, we would be operating wow. in a much greater state of, of integration and humbleness that allows for the universe to not be marginalized by our own egoic minds that think we're either better than or less than anything None of that is relevant. We just are here as is everyone else. And when we could, if we could, and we can learn to operate that way, there'd be a greater sense of love emerging from each one of us. And we would get along better on the surface of this planet. We would heal. We would have this life that we long for, uh, particularly at these times. So hopefully that's helpful. How I make my decision. Yeah. I'm so glad I, I, I asked that question that there's so much in that. And that picture you held up is incredible. Like seeing the totality of your, your whole self. It really yes, starts it to is. show. It is amazing. This is who we really are. We think this is who we are. We think this is who we are. And we pray to this and like, can you connect with God and get me something here that I need? And is it you know, my higher self or my angels or guides? All of that is true, but all of that is you. We are this and 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 this. And right now we're being this. We aren't human beings. We're just being human. We've projected our consciousness here and we're living right here at this plane. But this plane is easier to navigate if we're awake up here driving this thing. If we're awake from here guiding what we do. And that's a new perspective for people. And uh, I love putting images to it in all of the coursework that I teach. I'm always, I was just working with my graphic designer before we started our conversation, creating these ways that people can see it because when we can see it, we can, we can land it. And when we can land it, we can start allowing it to be true for ourselves. So awesome. hundred percent. Yeah. I only heard yesterday. Um, was it yesterday? I can't remember, but we've, we've been conditioned to worship the door, but now's the time to actually step through the door and actually see that we are it. You know, and I thought, oh, wow, that's a really great way. Of yes. Putting it. You know, in in terms of that, you know, I, I speak to audiences and when we, when we were gathering and doing all that. I'd speak to audiences of thousands of people and I would ask them, raise your hand if if you feel like something big is about to happen in your life. Like you you're just on the precipice of something happening, something changing. You've almost got it. You're in this threshold. It's like this doorway. So you're about it's about to happen. And 99% of the people in the room, 95% would raise their hand. 95% of the people would raise their hand 
and say, I feel like I'm about to have this opening, this breakthrough, like something's about to emerge and happen and change in my life. And I would explain to them, the reason that you feel that it's about to happen is because you don't have the circuits in place for it to actually happen, to go ahead and step through. And so this is what I do. I teach people how to build the electromagnetic energy circuitry, which then in turn al allows for the nervous system to have neurocircuitry to, to establish a state of being that is stable enough to realize, oh, I'm just going to step through this door. Oh, I found this doorway. I'm just going to step through it and just create and innovate and bring it and generate it instead of sitting on the other side of that doorway and waiting for a sign that it's safe mm -hmm. to step through the doorway. We're the ones that are the sign painters. <laughs> we're the sign painters. So if we're waiting for a sign, you know, hmm, it's time to sense and feel that the universe is nothing but a sign. And when we learn how to read that and feel it, you know, we can step through that, through that doorway and allow things to go ahead and change. We can allow ourselves to go ahead and be more than our history to be more than the effect of things that have happened and things that people have said and all that. We get it on a conscious level, but we have to learn how to unpack that subconscious stuff that is holding all that, you know, that is that placeholder for stability and who I am. And it's not true either. It's just subconscious. And we have to learn how to open the trap door and get into that information. We have to learn to use the body to show the mind our wholeness because mind, body, and spirit are really what it's all about but we operate identified as one and the mind and if we yeah. can get the mind to connect to the body which is what i initially start teaching people to do then mind and body have a more momentum they have enough power and if we realize that spirit in the body is breath in the body we bring mind body and breath together now we're starting to really pull ourselves back from the splat and learn how to navigate this world in a way that is grounded, solid, integrated, viable, sustainable, and available, available for something new to be true, rather than just depending on the past in order to figure out who I am. I'm not just a product of my past. And, and that's what we have to be courageous enough to truly release and, uh, and rewrite absolutely. it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I just had a couple of questions to wrap things up for you. Um, I could go, I could go on all day, honestly, with the, the, the things that are coming out at the moment, but what, what does the future hold for you? Uh, you know, you, are you just going to continue? Cause you seem to be in flow. You seem to be living more in the moment than ever. Um, what do the next few years look like? Yes. You know, I know that uh, I am I am very much feeling in a state of flow. I feel I don't feel the resistance of life that that many people do. And I know that it's a byproduct of the work that I've been doing because I used to feel very resistant and it was a struggle and I had to muscle in and make it happen. And and it I was very shy and very intimidated about life and thought that that my what I had to offer really wasn't anything. And and as it turns out, the world is very hungry for what I was holding inside as as this thing that, you know, isn't doesn't really have a place. It has such a place and it is it's, it's time is now. So I I could say that what the future holds for me is is an even greater unfoldment to just allowing this this flood to flood through. And I am so rejuvenated constantly and I have an endless supply of energy to do and to deliver and to share and to, to bring together and to, to teach and to do everything that I can to be in service to humanity. And the more uh, that that happens, the more fulfilling it feels. And so I would imagine that my next few years are going to be allowing the floodgates to open even more and um, and to be reaching into additional aspects of humanity. People, you know, I love speaking to this slice of humanity that is interested in this conversation. And I'm also curious about the slices of humanity who aren't necessarily interested in the conversation, but need the conversation. So I'm interested in learning how to infuse it into their lives and into their their ways of being and their lifestyles in a non-intimidating, inviting way so that we can 
truly wrap our arms around uh, everyone, not just preach to the choir, not just be here in this moment, but also uh, reach out just as you're reaching out with your podcast and in, in all sorts of different ways and, and inviting all sorts of different people to come and to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in doing that uh, the same in, inside of this entire world of the, of the quantum infusion into regular daily living. Yeah, absolutely. It's well, it's getting that hook like that. I needed that hook, you know, that language or something to bring me in from a different perspective. And then once, once I started to embody it, I was like, "Ha ha! Okay, now I'm starting to understand this now, where it was just in the head before." You know, yeah. um, just I have one more question for you. But before I ask the final question for the show, Sue, if people want to uh, learn more about your work, where can, where can we send them? Oh, sure. the best place? All the links I'll put in the show notes as well, but it's great to say it out loud. Oh, sure. Yes, yes. Uh, DrSueMorter.com. It's just D-R-S-U-E-M-O-R-T-E-R.com. And there is a world of uh, exploration there. I'm always teaching introductory classes online and and always reaching out through social media, letting people know. So it, it's pretty easy to find. My company is also called Mortar Institute. It's an institute where I teach people how to do a hands-on work with people and also remote healing with people uh, uh, in, in one school of bioenergetics. There's another school of higher consciousness inside the institute where I'm wow. teaching people about this, you know, withdrawal of the senses, building the circuitry and, and elevating our consciousness personally. And then another school inside of the institute that is called Body Awake Yoga. And it is a way of building the neuro circuitry to awaken inside of yoga asana because yoga asana has sacred geometries. Um, and that is what it's built upon. And when we put the body in these certain shapes, it allows the energy to move through it more easily. And that's why yoga has stood the test of time for thousands of years as a, a healing modality, which is what it actually is, is in an, an awakening, illuminating. And so I'm teaching people how to do that while inside of yoga practice. So I love doing all of them. I do all of them all the time. And uh, there's lots on the website that you can find about if any of those things are of interest. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot there. Wow. Um, the, the last question I finished with everyone on the show is who is um, with everything we've covered today. Is there anything you'd love to leave the listeners to ponder on? Sure. Uh, you know, everything is energy. It's just light. It's energy. Light is the highest vibrational frequency of energy. You are energy. You are made of energy. You are the light of consciousness in energy form, compressing yourself into this physical reality. And you are formless in your true state. You are available for anything. You have infinite capacity. And we simply have to learn how to manage ourselves here in this physical life in such a way that we allow that to express. There is nothing broken. There is nothing wrong. There's nothing missing. It isn't that at all. And we don't need to turn our attention to figuring out what our blockages are so that we can fix them. If we do so, we shouldn't stay there very long. We should then turn our attention to what is it that I am that I haven't been realizing? What is it that I could be that I haven't been allowing? You know, what is the perfected template version of me? What is this one like if I don't interfere with it and it just expresses here? What would that be like? And when we turn our attention to that, that question starts getting answered. When we turn our attention to what is wrong, that question starts getting answered. But then we still find it and we don't necessarily know what to do about it. When in reality, if we would just be in touch with what is right and what is whole and what is complete, it'll take care of this stuff automatically without us having to micromanage it. We just let the process happen. So nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing wrong. Let's celebrate that and hmm. learn all the ways that we can do that and live a better life. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. Sue, I just want to thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for everything you do. You know, um, you're, you're an inspiration, honestly. You, you clearly live and embody this work. And, and for somebody like me that's continuing to delve into that work, it's just wonderful to see and very inspiring. So thank you for um, making yourself available and putting yourself out there. It's, uh, it's certainly greatly appreciated from this end as well. So it's my you. pleasure. It's my honor, Guy, and thank you for what you're doing. You are uh, an amazing presence, and the energy that comes from you is very pure and very clear. And so the voice that you are in the world by doing all that you're doing is exactly what is needed at this time. So 
thank you for doing what you are doing. It's a pleasure to be here and I'll be back anytime. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.